Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Talk Freelance to Me podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Cisneros Mejia, and I am so excited, everyone. Today, we have our first ever man on the podcast, and it's the wonderful, I can't wait for you guys to meet him. This is Damon Brown, everyone. Welcome, Damon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for, I'm I'm glad to break new ground. I didn't know yes, <laughs> this is a big deal. There's a lot of we love our our mamas and our sisters, and we've got you know lots of girls on this show. So this is very very special to have you here, freelance fam. Just to let you know, I recently had the opportunity to attend the ASJ virtual conference. It's the American Society of Journalists and Authors, great organization. And Damon actually served on the leadership board for years and years. I want to say right, Damon. Yeah, for about um, I was uh, about six years, something like that. That's fantastic. I'm new to the group, but I had the honor of hearing your keynote presentation, and it was so amazing. And so I just I asked if you could be on the show, and so thank you so much for carving out some time from your very busy schedule to be here with us today. Absolutely, and yeah, thanks for having me, Ashley. I'm happy to support. As we talked about off camera, like I like the work that you're doing, and you know, and the conversation that you're trying to start. Yeah. Thank you so much. And so freelance fam, I'm going to read you a little bit from Damon's bio. He's done a lot. (laughs) So this is a brief summary so you can kind of get acquainted with his experience. Former ASJ board member Damon Brown helps side hustlers, solopreneurs, and other non-traditional creatives bloom. A best-selling author, four-time TED speaker, and a longtime freelance writer for Playboy, New York Post, and others, Damon also co-founded the popular platonic connection app, Cuddler, and led it to acquisition within one year, all while being the primary caretaker of his infant first son. He now guides others through his private consulting and coaching business, has free weekly e-newsletters at joindamon.me, and a very popular hashtag bring your worth show every Wednesday and Sunday at youtube.com forward slash Brown Damon. He has a new book coming out called The Complete Bring Your Worth Collection. It's going to be available October 20th, and you can take his free creative resource quiz at buildingfromnowquiz.com. Damon, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. This bio is like hashtag goals, like the kids say. So, oh, <laughs> like the youngins say, <laughs> like the youngins, as we can say now, right. right? You've done so amazing. Like these things are so diverse from the app and getting it acquired, your Silicon Valley time, your time as a journalist. Like, can you just tell us some more about your journey going from a journalist to this serial entrepreneur that you are now? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. I appreciate the, the very flattering bio. So my main thing when I was much, much younger, younger than uh, my wife and I's youngest son, I have a almost 10-year-old and a recent seven-year-old, both boys. And so when I was younger than my wife and I's youngest son, then I was really into telling stories and I was really into technology. And my mom says I was really into both when I was around three. So this is very much an innate This is just what I was drawn to. I was born in the 70s. And so I was lucky enough to be born at a time when technology was blooming. So the first VCRs came out, all that stuff. Yeah. Right. If you think about the 70s, it was kind of the innovative time with the technologies and the foundation and stuff that we do today. And so there was always a conflict as I went through school. I did fine in school and I'm going to grad school and other things like academically, I did fine. But there was always this conflict between me hanging out with the people who are quoting Shakespeare and me hanging out with the folks who are trying to reprogram the microwave. Like there was always this conflict between the bookworms and the nerds, you know, which I identify with both the terms that we've embraced over the years. And it wasn't until probably late college where suddenly we realized that communication was going to be impacted by technology. And then all of a sudden the stuff that I've been studying started to make sense. And so that made it a lot easier for me to take a leadership role with ASJ to kind of see where things were going ahead of time, just because I've been studying those things as far as technology and communication merging the whole time. My main thing as my career has progressed, so we can get deeper into this however you like, is seeing how 
intimacy and connecting with each other is impacted and actually can be driven by technology. And so with second app that I founded called Cuddler, it was myself and two other uh, co-founders. The main thing was to connect people for hugs. And at that period of time, it was 2014 and my wife and I's first son was about to turn one. And at that period of time, the big concern was Facebook was the biggest company on the planet. So again, we have to go back about 10 years ago before they turned meta and all these other things were happening and people, it was just this discussion. I was just starting about how technology might not be connecting us the way that it should. And there's a level of superficiality with that. Even with the so-called hookup apps like Grindr and Tinder, and some of you single folks might know what I'm talking about, particularly <laughs> in that era. Right. That was the vibe. And my co-founders and I realized that there was a gap there for people who wanted to have that human connection, but didn't necessarily have access to it. And we ended up having, we launched it, bootstrapped it, which meant we funded ourselves. We had a quarter million users at our peak. And then we ended up getting acquired shortly after our son's second birthday. So it was about, I think it ended up, we ended up selling about 11 months after we started. And what we realized was that, and the hypothesis, particularly from my end, was that technology could actually be used to connect with people. And there's one message in particular, because I was a COO, essentially, so I was handling the day-to-day, while one of my colleagues was actually the CEO and the face of the company. And so I handled all the email. You got a quarter million users, you're getting a lot of email every single day. DMs, messages, you name it. It was, it was crazy. And I remember one message being from, and it sounded like an older gentleman. I want to say he was in his 80s and his wife passed away a number of years before. And since then, he hadn't had any physical connection. And our facts and our app allowed him to connect with someone else. And I was like, okay, that's why we're doing this. That's what got me up in the morning. And so, again, using that technology to actually connect people rather than to separate people. And I think that ties into our work as communicators, where we can use, I talked about this during the keynote, we can use AI to outsource our work, for lack of a better term, and lean on that a lot more. And it might get us some quick money, but it's not going to have the thumbprint, the patina, the energy, the soul of what we have as creators. Just like if we were to use a chat bot a few years ago, or just lean on automated social media 10 years ago, or just start doing blogs without, just because we want to get a book deal 20 years ago. Like I've been in the game long enough, and perhaps you have too, where you start to see these cycles. Today, a lot of these cycles are based on technology. And my work as a business coach, as a keynote, the different things that I do, even if it's doing another startup, the intention is to say technology is a tool And if you feel like you have to give up your soul or that you're going to be out of a job because of this technology, then you might be using the technology wrong. Maybe there's another way we can use this technology to connect people. Maybe we use this technology to communicate more. Maybe we use this technology to um, pour more humanity into the world. And as we talked about offline, like with the pandemic, and we're going into the fourth year of this, a lot of the work that I do and other people do, and including some of my mentors who I adore, that's starting to come into the spotlight because people are realizing that technology without humanity, it doesn't mean anything. And things can change that quick. And suddenly all the technology in the world isn't going to help you. What's going to help is a connection to, you know, to other people. So that's my very long way of saying that's my that's my intention. And for me, it's not me doing a whole bunch of things. It's just that one core idea And then that message or that creating happening across different mediums. That's the way I really look at the career. I love it. I think that idea of connection, because that's what we do. That's what stories do, right? They help us connect to idea, to lessons, to morals, to other people, give us information. And with Cuddler, you know, you were really helping people connect in a, a physical way. I think that's beautiful. And that's that's part of who we are as humans. That's what separates us from the robots is that we're social creatures. We can't live by ourselves. Like, you know, all the scientists have, have showed that, that babies have to be cuddled, have to be touched, that sense 
Oh, the, the baby studies break my heart. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. Even, you know, we talked off camera about our kids and, you know, having children. And I remember even, you know, when I was pregnant for the first time, learning about, you know, the skin to skin contact when you first have a baby. And, you know, I didn't know any of these things. I'm learning it new. And even just talking to like my grandmother, like her experience having a baby was way different for a variety of reasons. But one of those things that skin to skin contact, that wasn't a thing when she was giving birth in the 60s. You know, and for me, it was like, you have your baby and then you immediately, it's for bonding. And so I think you tapping into the ability to connect people, both with your storytelling, your ability to connect people with Cuddler, you definitely, like people might see your career and just be like, wow, there it is so diverse. And it is, but there is that through line that you can see, that connection, that using technology as a way to connect. I love Thank it. Thank you. And for those of you who are trying to figure it out, that took me a long time to see that through line. And as people much wiser than myself, like I'm thinking of like Jonathan Fields and I'm thinking of uh, Jenny Blake and Dory Clark, a lot of fellow coaches who have been in the game longer than me, who I, who I have a lot of respect for. All of them say that you should be driven by curiosity. And, you know, we also understand that from the journalist standpoint, right? It's like, oh, the story is going to be on the cover of the New Yorker or whatever. It's like, no, that's not actually how you find good stories. What you do is you get curious and ask certain questions, even if you're just asking yourself questions about the subject. And you're like, there might be something deeper here. Let me pull on that thread. And then when you start to pull on that thread, then suddenly you start to see things come together for... I have three best-selling books out of the 26 that I've done. The three that became bestsellers, I didn't know they were going to be bestsellers before I wrote them. You know what I mean? With doing Cuddler. And right before that, I did an app called So Quotable, which captured people's quotes. So Quotable did okay, and I learned a lot. The second one blew up, and we're in the cover of the Wall Street Journal. But I, because I did the first one on my own, I was curious about the first one. And then when I joined my partners, I was curious about the second one. It was the same process. I have books that have sold literally a dozen copies. I got some stinkers. And then I have other ones that have sold thousands. Same process. And so that's what I would encourage if you're, uh, particularly if you're a freelancer, we're curious about so many different things. And a lot of us are what they call multi-hyphenates. Yeah. Where we're interested in, right? We're interested in one thing. And then we're interested in this other thing and this other thing. And when people ask us at a cocktail party what we do, then we get confused. That was <laughs> right. me for right. That was me for several years, if not decades. I've written about this in the Bites as an Entrepreneur, where I wasn't really sure. And then suddenly the through lines started to come through. And that's why I can be so concise about it now. But I'm a little bit into my career, so now I see it. But as Steve Jobs says, your job is to follow the dots, and then you won't be able to connect them until after you've done some of the work and suddenly you start to see the connection. So I would encourage people, if you are trying to figure out multiple things, don't try to box yourself in quite yet because there's going to be a natural pattern that's going to start to show up. That's so good. That's so good because a lot of times I think, you know, entrepreneurs, storytellers, all of us, whenever we're creating something out of nothing, something that doesn't exist yet, a lot of times I think that we can get a little paralyzed in the thinking part and we put off the doing. But what I'm hearing from you is by you doing over and over 26 books. I mean, you have this, you have the recipe you've done. And then afterward, you see, wow, that was a bestseller. But that process, you don't get that clarity until the end. You don't get that clarity until you start. And I think that's true with anything, with a business, with serving customers. I mean, you've got to, you've got to put one foot, you got to put something out there in order to get to figure it out. Yeah, there's a wonderful quote from Chase Jarvis. He's a founder of Creative Live, and I think he sold the company, has moved on. But he has this book called Creative Calling that talks about that. And my favorite quote from the book is he says, you can't steer a parked car. So in other words, if you want to refine what you're doing, get your stuff together. I've done 300 plus episodes of the Bring Your Worst show. And I'm just now getting to the point where like my visuals are starting to look right. And I'm like, okay, now I know what I'm doing wrong. Now this is how I can improve them. And I look at my first batch of episodes and I start cringing, but that's the way it's supposed to be. Yes. Cause I could be sitting here, you know, you could see my office. I could be sitting here in this little office planning everything for the past two, two and a half years. Cause it started two years ago. I could sit here for two and a half years trying to plan the perfect episode and then record it. And I still wouldn't have learned 
unless I did the 300. That's the process. And not being afraid to move and not being afraid to have something fall apart a little bit and then learn from it falling apart. And that's been priceless for, for me personally. Yeah. So good. Thank you so much, Damon. So you've done, like we said, so much. And you've also, this whole time that you've been creating and innovating and doing these businesses, these apps, you've also been writing the whole time. You've been a longtime freelance writer for in big publications, well-known household name publications like Playboy and the New York Post and your column in Inc. Magazine, which as a business journalist, I love that. I'm like fangirling over here <laughs> about Inc. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you. Yeah. So can you give us, there's a lot of writers who listen to this, a lot of freelance writers. Is there advice, is there secrets that you can share for people who want to pitch to these high profile publications? I'd say the, the first step is to make sure that your network is good. I started writing for Playboy and I talked about this in, in one of my keynotes. If you go to bringyourworth.tv, I talk about this in one of the keynotes where I ended up connecting with Playboy because I was at an alumni meeting for Northwestern. So that's where I got my master's. And it was someone in the buffet line, I swear. There's someone in the buffet line, everybody had their tags, and their tag said that they were editor of Playboy. And so I talked to them, you know, while they're, they're passing the carrots. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like yesterday, which is why I'm, actually, I don't blush at all. I'm actually blushing at this. I'm like, the audacity. <laughs> but that was the moment. That was the moment. That was your opportunity. Yeah. Otherwise, I might not be talking to you right now. Like, so, <laughs> you know, that was many years ago. And so that was the opportunity with that. With Inc. Magazine, it was actually through ASJ. And it was an ASJ colleague who was doing stuff with Inc. And they found out that I had just sold my company. And they're like, hey, we're actually looking for columnists. You might have an interesting POV since you just sold your startup. So then the two kind of pieces with that is number one, having your network right. It could be your alumni network. It could be an organization like ASJ. I regularly go to the TED conference. So it could be something like that. We actually pay to be in this environment. And so when you're working through that, you naturally get opportunities with people who see the work that you're doing. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, Ashley's doing some amazing stuff over there with their podcast. Maybe we could have her do this column you know, that kind of thing. I think the second part of that dynamic is actually always be creating something. And so if you already are doing a podcast, then you're more likely to get the attention of these organizations. The best dynamics I found is that when people or organizations see you doing the work that you claim that you want to do, and they're like, okay, you're representing what you're doing. A friend of mine, Nilla for Merchant, she has a book called The Power of Onlyness. And she has one of my favorite terms. It's called signaling. So for instance, the way that I'm dressed right here, I'm signaling a certain thing so that people identify with that, with me having a nice blazer and one of my homemade t-shirts. You know, it's available from DavenBrown.net. That represents something where it's like I'm wearing the gear that I made myself, but I also have a nice suit on, you know, blazer on top of it. And it's like that signals a certain thing to the community or certain people that, that I connect with. If you're giving out those particular signals, then that means that tribe or that group that wants to rock with you will recognize you and be part of that wave or that cultural change that you're trying to make. You might use different language than I would. I'm really big on cultural change, but whatever impact you're trying to make, if you're not signaling the right thing, like if I was wearing like a rock t-shirt and it had a couple holes in it, which I love rock and roll. I got musicians right behind me on, on, my, on my wall, but that wouldn't be the signal of the people that I'm trying to connect with, nor the people I'm trying to lead. So this represents me and the bigger idea. If you're able to create articles, podcasts, in our case of journalists, any type of medium that represents the direction you want to go in, then you'll be able to get the attention and the discussion of the different people and organizations that you want to work with. That makes so much sense. I love it. I think that there's a quote that talks about, you know, dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. And that makes so much sense. I appreciate that. And so in addition to all this journalism work, you've also written 
26 books, did you say? Yeah, the 27th is coming out in October. Yeah, I love books. Amazing. I love that. So what's your secret? There's so many people who say, I have a book in me, I want to write one, and they can't, they're having trouble with the first one. And you've done this 27 times. So do you have any secrets to sticking to this process, completing the manuscript and actually publishing these books, and how you've been able to be so consistent with it time after time? Thank you for the compliments. It's not as smooth as it looks. So I just put that out there. I think there's a few different secrets. The first one is to start writing your book before you actually do the book. And so my first major bestseller was The Bite Says Entrepreneur. And that was shortly after I sold the startup. And it's available in the compilation coming out to complete Bring Your Worth collection. It was 21 chapters. About a third of those chapters were based or modified on my ink column that I've been doing. So if you kind of want to work backwards, which I believe it was Tom Peters, Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey talked about uh, begin with the end in mind. And so if you work backwards from there, I got the opportunity while well, I sold my startup. That got me on the radar of colleagues who were working with Ink Magazine. They said, did you want to do a column? I said, sure. I did about a column or two a week for about a year. And then all of a sudden, those columns started to form into a bigger narrative. And that bigger narrative became the Bites as Entrepreneur. And there was quite a process to get that published. It's actually published under my own imprint because the publishers in New York didn't see the vision of what I was trying to do. So then that ended up starting me self-publishing and then it became a bestseller. And then because I was self-publishing that I have the opportunity to publish as much as I want to. So there are all these little curiosities, we'll call them that, all these little curiosities that led up to that. So it wasn't a matter of me saying, hey, I'm gonna publish a book. It was a matter of me saying, I just sold my startup something that took up a lot of my time is now gone. And I want to do more freelancing. And I also want to share some of the insights I've got. Because I don't know, I didn't know anyone else who sold their startup, actually, maybe two other people. So it's like who I knew really well, where I could talk to them about it. Other than that, it was me. And being a 30 something black male, who's taking the lead at home, you know, raising the, then became two kids shortly after that, My, my wife had a traditional job. It was like, there was no blueprint for me. And so I'm like, well, how can I, there's stories I have to tell. How am I going to tell people these stories? Oh, there's an opportunity with Ink Magazine. Oh, okay. Well, maybe now I can, I tell other people's stories, but I can help unpack all this intensity because from the beginning of the second startup to us selling it was less than a year. So it was this, wor- yeah, it was a whirlwind. Yeah. We started right before around the time of our son's first birthday. No, I'm sorry. We started it two months after my son's first birthday. And then we sold it right after his second birthday. So it was about a 10 month period. That was it. Wow. That's fast. Yeah. Whirlwind. So then I'm actually unpacking some of it for myself. And the book gave me the opportunity to do that. So I think the first thing is to figure out what you're actually curious about and start building to that now, not to wait and say, oh, I want to have a book to do. I want to have an agent. It's like, no, start writing that now. Because my first major bestseller was based on columns that I wrote for Ink Magazine well before I was thinking about writing another book. And so I'd say, number one, start start writing towards that particular process. And I'd say number two, which ties into number one, already start serving the people that you want that book later to be for. And so that my idea of the non-traditional entrepreneur, that started in 2016 with the Bites as Entrepreneur. And so through my column with joindamon.me to the show at bringyourworth.tv, I've been just serving the same community. If you're plugged into that particular community, back to Noah for Merchant's idea of signaling, if you're plugged into the community that you want to serve and you're signaling to them, hey, I'm here to serve you, not only do you have a built-in audience for whatever you create, which financially and otherwise is fantastic, which has allowed me to literally function and have the career that I have. But then the second part of that is that your audience, if you're plugged into them, will actually tell you what they want next. And so after the Bites of Entrepreneur turned to a series, and then I am doing a left field book called Bring Your Worth, which is really a, that me working as a coach and helping out creators, freelancers, entrepreneurs, I realized that a lot of the challenges they had as far as how much they charged for their work, how much they were able to make an impact on the world. There was this root issue 
with them not feeling like their voice mattered. And it is about 2018, 2019. So that's become a big part of the discussion now, which makes my heart feel big. Four or five years ago, we weren't really discussing. We we're discussing how much we got paid as creators. But as a coach, I realized there was a, a deeper problem, a root problem, where it's like, how are you going to get $3 a word from the Smithsonian when you don't really think your words are worth 30 cents? How are we going to navigate that gap? And in being connected with our community, I realized Bring Your Worth was the next book that we needed to have. And the book came out and it bombed. But then three, four years later, suddenly it's picking up steam and it's become one of my better books. And obviously it's the name of my imprint now and the TV show. And I have people contacting me now saying, I found this old book that you had from 2019 and I just grabbed it. And this is what I would need to hear right now. And it made me emotional because I'm all like, yeah, like I put my foot, as we say in my culture, I put my foot in that book. Like I really put my energy into that book, but it wasn't the time for it. Mm, they weren't ready yet. Yeah. But because I was connected to the community, I had a feeling that's what they would need next. So I think that would be the second part is staying connected to those communities that you want to serve and then being about two or three steps ahead in the journey. And if you're two or three steps ahead in the journey, then you can help them get to where you are and you can create content or media, whatever you're doing, you can create stuff that's going to serve them the following month, the following year. That's, I think, at least in my experience, that's how you build something. Because then you're like, you're a few steps ahead. I have a feeling this is what you're going to need in 2024. Let me go ahead and build that. And having the patience, the perseverance, even finding the resources sometimes to build on that level will allow you to have a longer career because then you'll be ahead of the game. And then people will be like, yeah, Ashley's exactly, she has this voice where she already knows where I'm going. Right. You know what I mean? That's so good. So you shared so many gems <laughs> within that bit. Thank you so much. When you mentioned that it was about 10 months from when you started Cuddler to when it was acquired. Yeah, September to uh, July, I think. So yeah, whatever that is. That's amazing. What are the biggest, maybe the top two key lessons that you got from that experience from selling your app that you just started? That's amazing. Wow. I said the number one thing is that you're not going to be for everyone. My mother always talks about this. I'm thinking about my mom right now. And so when we launched Cuddler, within a week, it became the number one app in several countries. So America, Canada, Germany, for some reason, Australia. Like I still remember these odd, odd countries. <laughs> they need hugs. They need hugs, exactly. Right? And I think we had 100,000 downloads and 10,000 completed hugs, which is like our metric within the first week. At the exact same time, I'm giving this context for a reason. It's not a humble brag. I'm giving this for a reason. The exact same week, we were roasted on the late night talk shows and the morning shows and by my former freelance contributor, contribution uh, publication, the New York Post. So we were getting roasted. But that's how you know you made it, right? If you're on... <laughs> <laughs> right? right, if you're on page six or whatever the equivalent is now. Exactly, yeah. right. Now, it was like the Kelly Ripa and Michael Strahan at the time show, you know, the morning show, and they're ripping into Cuddler. Go on YouTube, do a Google search for C-U-D-D-L-R. They were ripping us a new one, as they used to say. And what we realized was, number one, all press is good press. In that case, it actually helped. People are like, why are people talking about this app all of a sudden? So then pe more people downloaded it, of course. But then it also showed that there was a specific audience Seth Godin calls it the minimal viable audience. So the people that really get the stuff that you're doing, you hone in on them. We could have been like, oh, this is embarrassing. They're making fun of us. Let's pull the plug. But we didn't because we were serving the audience that we intended. A lot of people that I coach and even myself, sometimes we get, we get lost in that because we're like, oh, okay, well, this book only sold a hundred copies. So it must not be doing it. There's a fantastic quote, and I'm going to mess it up. So forgive me to all you, all you hardcore uh, history buffs. But I believe it was the Sex Pistols, Never Mind the Bullocks, which uh, they're a punk band, very late 60s, early 70s. Sid Vicious and other folks were in there as well as, yeah. Anyway, big detour there. Their album didn't do very well at all. It bombed. 
But the saying is that every person who bought a copy of their album started a punk band. And so perhaps the Ramones, much later, it would be Green Day, you know, which is more in my generation in the 90s. They got a copy of that Sex Pistols album and then they did something with it. That's, as I was talking about with my book, Bring Your Worth, the sales were rough. I just had a bestseller and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, maybe this is a wrap. But the people that got the book got the book. And then now they're doing cool stuff because they let me know. They're like, hey, this inspired me to do this, that, and the third. And so to not mistake the numbers and the quantity for you not hitting the people that you want to hit. So that's like the, the biggest lesson, number one, from us working with Cuddler, especially after the acquisition. It's like, of course, but while we we're going through it, it was not quite as clear. I'd say the second thing is knowing when to stop. And it was shortly after Valentine's Day where I ended up, I would have morning meetings with my other co-founder because the third co-founder was more in the background. And we'd have morning meetings. And I remember getting up super early in the morning because that's when, when I would work with them. And we got on our Zoom call, or whatever the equivalent was. And I was like, I think, think this is it. And he was like, yeah, this is it. Because we knew that we accomplished whatever we were going to accomplish. And for me, it was showing that technology could be used to connect people rather than separate people. We got a quarter million users like, it, okay. And so then when we had that conversation, that's when the calls started to come in as far as potential acquisition. But we knew that that wave had crested. We did the very best that we could. Again, we were on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Like we already created this economy using their terms, the cuddle economy. And so there were professional cuddlers, people who get paid to give hugs. They were apps like clones. <laughs> like it was an amazing period of time. But we had the number one app in the world twice in 2014, 2015. And so it's like, okay, at a certain point, you have to know that there's another road for you to be on. And then that's when the acquisition happened. But if we kept doing it for like another 10 years, will we just be riding it out? Will we just want to, with the fame that was connected to Cuddler? Will we be afraid to quit? And be like, let's move on to the next thing. And I think if you're going to make an impact, you're going to have that bravery to say, okay, that's enough. Again, with the Bites as Entrepreneur had a certain tone and it became a bestseller. And I also knew that the people I was serving need to have a different conversation. And so even though they weren't comfortable with the left turn, I'm like, but I have to make the left turn. And that hurt. <laughs> but in the long run, it's like, oh no, but that was exactly what they needed. I just might have been a little bit early with it. But again, my argument is that you're supposed to be a little bit early. Otherwise, why are we the experts? How are we serving our community if we're just sitting with them? We have to be a little bit in the future. I love that. I love that. That's really, really good. And I think it ties into something that I was reading where you talk about the concept of serving this audience needs before even others recognize the value. And it sounds like that's a superpower that you have in being able to kind of anticipate a what's coming a what the audience would need, but also be there first in the market before would be competitors see the opportunity. Like it sounds like you're kind of well, the only pushback I would give would be, I think, as, as cultural tastemakers as media people, I think it's a superpower that all of us can develop. Like, I, I don't think I'm unique in that. If I was unique in that, I wouldn't be a business coach. Because then I'd be like, no, this is something I, I understand. No one else can understand. <laughs> I'm not going to coach anybody else this. It's like, no, I, I believe this is, as journalists, as creators, I think we have that instinct developed. I think the challenge is that we don't always trust that instinct. So when my first major book, I want to say I got 42 rejections. It was a lot. Wow. It was a lot. And the book came out and it made an impact. But the publishers I was speaking to, it wasn't even New York. It was like New York, <laughs> LA, San Francisco. I was talking to all the publishers, but they didn't see the vision. But I did because I'm part of that culture. So that's that's what I mean by trusting it. Not trusting as far as not hearing it, but not trusting as, as far as not going with it. Like if someone wanted to do a book on how to work remotely and they did the book in, and they were pitching the book in 2019. Then I've been working remotely for a while because I have some international clients. I would buy the book if I was a publisher and be like, yes, I published that book. But a lot of people wouldn't. And then six months later, 
everyone's remote. Everybody needs that book. <laughs> yeah. Everybody needs three copies. Not to mention virtual schooling. And there's some great people in ASJ who have specialized in homeschooling for years. And suddenly their books are on the, t- you know, the bestseller list, <laughs> as a lot of us. Because I know your kids are, are, are similar age to mine. So it's like a lot of us are virtual schooling. A lot of us are still virtual schooling. The whole thing. But if you don't listen to that instinct and go with it, then that's a lost cause. And the worst feeling in the world is interacting with a creative who have that insight, but because other people didn't co-sign that idea, they didn't go with it. And then ends up being a large organization, another creator, or even in the case of the pandemic, the circumstances change. And that brilliant idea is still on the shelf and it's too late. That hurts. That's why I'm really into the side hustle. That's why I'm really into trying to find ways to get your idea off the ground without using all your resources. Because if you're able to do that, again, that's why I have 26 books. Like they're just, they start as little sparks and I keep feeding the flame. I keep feeding the flame, whether it's through the ink column or ideas that I get as I'm doing the Bring Your Worst show or even ideas for my coaching clients. I'm talking with them, they're dealing with a particular struggle and I'm like, you know, that would actually make a really good episode. And then that episode becomes Career Remix, my book from a couple of years ago. Like all those different pieces, they're all there. And our job is to, with the resources that we have, is to move them around and start to piece it together so it can serve other people. And if we come from that angle, then it's actually not that difficult. And then that requires, like we talked about earlier, to go deep and be embedded into this community that you want to serve. I don't serve people in the C-suites. So I've had some coaching clients in the C-suites, nothing wrong with that, but that's not my primary audience. I don't serve people that are trying to get to the next level in their traditional corporate job. A couple of people I've coached have been in that area. Not so much though. My thing is not, not traditional entrepreneurs. So minimal viable audience. So because it's so narrow, I'm not writing for anybody else. That allows me to be a lot more productive. And so the more you focus on, again, the people you want to serve, And don't be afraid to say no to the things that don't fit the people that you're trying to serve. Then the more, I think, output's not the right word, but the more in tune you can be as far as creating and serving the audience that you really want to want to care about. I think we get into trouble when we start to dilute the different things just because we feel like that's what Playboy magazine wants. That's what I write for ARP. So that's what ARP wants, or that's what this book publisher wants, so I better change my message for that. I think there's ways, particularly with all the technology we have, to build that minimal viable audience and to be embedded, like a war reporter, to be embedded in the front lines and help them get to the next level. But you absolutely have to make a choice. And some folks don't want to do that, and that's okay. For me, though, that's been the secret to me being as productive and hopefully impacting folks as much as as I feel like I have. I think so. I think that's the key, right? Because even from just the consumer's perspective, or, you know, in your case, these the solo entrepreneurs, the freelancers, it is such a special world. It's it's different from corporate. It's different from having, you know, a small business and and having like a, a staff of 15 people. This flavor of entrepreneurship is so specific. And when you were talking about just that ability to serve and just knowing what they need, that comes across because everything that you're putting out is focused on them. And so when they see it, it's so refreshing. They feel like I'm home. You know, I found somebody who gets me. I found somebody who understands my specific piece of this entrepreneurship pie. And I think it's just a match made in, you know, just beautiful things can come from that because you're in tune, they're in tuned. And you can go forth together in just this a synergistic way. It's it's really cool to see. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I agree with you. There's a going after the depth instead of the breadth. And if you're going to be in the game with ups and downs of freelancing, independence, bootstrapping your companies, I never got VC or venture capitalist funding for either one of my startups. If you're going to be in the wild, wild west, let's put it like that, then you need to make sure that your horse is strapped on, you know what I mean? You need to make sure that you you have a compass instead of a map because you need to go need where the understand where the geography is changing as opposed to where it was. Whatever analogies you want to use, 
you need to go for depth. Now, if you end up having something where it's more structure, then maybe you don't need to do the depth as much. But if you're going to be in this for the long haul, eventually you're going to have to work on the depth a little bit too. That's beautiful. In your ASJ talk, you were sharing a lot about AI. And I know in your coaching work, you're really focused on helping creative people develop ways to establish their passive income. And this is such a, I feel like a topic everybody's curious about, they want to know. And you've been able to really leverage AI. I know you were using MidJourney and you've been able to really, really make something of it and use it for products to create books. How can listeners use AI to work smarter and maybe create some digital products the way that you have? That's a really good question. I think the, the first step is to take the technology out of it, which might sound contradictory. In fact, it is but to figure out, again, who do you want to serve? And so in my case, I have my, again, the same book, The Bites of Entrepreneur from 2016. And I use MidJourney, which is a, a tool where you can write in a particular picture description and then it'll design the picture for you. It's very magical. It's it's very strange. Yeah, I've been using so it cool. for almost a year now. And yeah, like a lot of AI, it's, it feels like there's some elves in the box there. Very Keebler. So I use that to do a semi-animated slash illustrated version of my audiobook for The Bites is Entrepreneur. And then there's 21 chapters, like I mentioned. And so for 21 weeks, every Monday, I was premiering a new chapter. And with my larger audience now on the Bring Your Worst show, I realized a lot of them didn't know The Bites is Entrepreneur. Because my show premiered in 2020. The book came out in 2016. And so it was almost like a different phase of my career. And so I'm like, how can I package this in a way where I can serve the people that watch bringyourworth.tv and also repurpose, can't think of a more clinical term, but or a less clinical term, but repurpose the content that I've already created. And because I self-published it, I own owned an intellectual property. So I didn't have to call an agent. I didn't have to get permission from a publisher. I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Just kind of ran with it. And so in this case, it was a way to serve the not fish entrepreneurs who were getting to me through the channel and or didn't know me back when the book came out almost 10 years ago. So I think number one, it starts with thinking about who you want to serve. I think the second part is seeing how technology can be a partner or an ally. That doesn't mean you plug a bunch of stuff or write a bunch of stuff into you the hottest AI platform, and then it spits out an article for you, and then you go and try to publish the article. It doesn't mean that. What it means is, let's say if you want to improve an article that you've written, that means maybe using that AI tool and say, hey, can you give me some insight as far as how I can make this article stronger? Or even taking a step back. Smithsonian, as I mentioned a couple of times, that was my dream publication when I first started freelancing. And so if that existed back then, it was well before AI took off, but if that existed back then, I could do the query that I spent two days writing, no exaggeration for Smithsonian, that was about to mail through the mail system, right? So cool. <laughs> right? And, and do the safety, the self-addressed stamped stamp envelope, I'm going to tell you how old I am, right? But putting it in there and I, you know, print it off on my dot matrix printer, if I had the equivalent of some of the AI platforms, I'd go ahead and put in the query and say hey, where does the gr grammar not quite match? Or how can I make this more persuasive? And then maybe all these years later, maybe I would have been a reg regular writer for the Smithsonian <laughs> instead of getting rejections from them. Those are ways that we can partner with technology. I am not an artist, as I mentioned during the ASJ keynote. And so MidJourney in this case was able to animate, make these beautiful illustrations that I couldn't do if I had a gun to my head. So it's you doing the things that I literally cannot do at this period of time in my career. And so for me, that's a smart way for creators to use AI, not to look at it as a replacement for our job, not to look at it as a hack so we don't we can work a lot less, more about what are those things that AI is really good at. There's a, a wonderful term that I, or a quote that I say probably about once a year, or I think about once a year, and that is, if you have a hammer, then every problem is a nail. So in other words, if you're saying, all right, I'm just going to depend on this one platform, and it doesn't have to be AI. I'm just going to depend on Facebook to build up my community. I'm just going to depend on LinkedIn for this. I'm going to depend on ChatGPT for this. I'm going to depend on MidJourney for this. 
and that ends up being all where you put all your eggs into all your resources, eventually that technology is going to get old and or it will pivot and or your community is going to want something more from you. And what you want to be is to be ahead of the curve and say, I'm partnering with MidJourney right now, but next year, maybe my show will be on the Vision Pro headset that Apple just announced earlier this year. That'd be cool. I'm not going to pretend that I'm not looking into it. <laughs> right. But that's partnering with technology because I can't make anything 3D, but Apple can. And so that's what I mean by still serving that same audience, still creating. Personally, my work hasn't changed. Even with new technology, I'm sure your work isn't going to change. What happens is that it gets augmented and as you partner with technology, but you're still serving the same audience. In so many cases, we're given the same message. It's just a different medium. And that's my one soapbox as I've talked to fellow creators and particularly fellow journalists over the years is that we keep falling into the trap that when a new technology comes and suddenly we're going to get wiped out or we need to put all our eggs into that basket. But then we don't realize that the following year there's going to be another technology. If you and I were having this podcast a year ago, we'll be talking about how you can get into the metaverse. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Facebook, as of this recording, a year ago, Facebook didn't even change their name yet. That's how quickly it moves. And being a tech guy, I'm all like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going <laughs> to. Yes, I'm partnering with MidJourney right now. Just like I partnered with, I, I had a boot camp on Teachable. That was three, four, five years ago. Teachable is going through a lot of stuff right now. So my boot camp isn't available on there like it was. But I partner with that technology to coach people. That technology is going in a different direction. A year ago, I had something on Decentraland, which is still available on Decentraland if you want to look it up. Decentraland has gone down. So now there's other ways to get the message out. But it's still the same message. And as creators, we need to think about that where we don't want to be wedded to a certain technology. Particularly nowadays, technology moves way too fast for us to say we're going to make an impact in the world based on this one particular technology. That's not the way that we want to approach this. The way we want to approach this is to say, who do I want to serve? How can I partner with technology to serve them better? And how can I create in a way that's agile enough and evergreen enough? That's the word I'm looking for, evergreen enough so that that message will ring true no matter what technology people get it on. So good. So good. Thank you so much. So you've done, we've been here talking a while and you've done a lot. And so I don't want to, I want to make sure I respect your time. I could talk to you all day. So please. Yeah. This is great. I love this. I love this. So you've been accomplishing all of this and also being a partner to your wife and a dad to your two boys. And so many people I, that I speak to that are in this, the Talk Freelance to Me audience, a lot are women, a lot are, are caregivers, both maybe they have kids, maybe they take care of their nephews or nieces or have aging parents, aging aunts and uncles. And so that ability, that flexibility and freedom that our nature, our freelance or independent work offers is really important. How have you been able to balance your responsibilities as a parent and then all of these entrepreneurial pursuits, and you've been so successful at them. How, how can we learn from you in that, that regard? Thank you. I'm going to take that last piece and run with it. You have to define what your metrics of success are. And so my wife started working from home about two, three years ago. She's a pediatrician and the amount of stuff that was happening, you can imagine. She was like, I need to shift things. So she's working from home now. Before that period of time, she had a traditional job as a pediatrician, and it would just be like me and the boys hanging out. My metrics had to change. As I talked about with, and I talked about this in the Bites of the Entrepreneur, again, that's part of the compilation that's coming out in October. If I was looking for what I did with my first startup, so quotable, it took me five months to do that. If it was with someone who knew technology a little bit better and or didn't have kids, because my son was born a few months before I started So Quotable. And so if it was someone who didn't have kids or wasn't married or had this kind of open schedule <laughs> that we all had at one, one period of time in our lives, then I could have done So Quotable in five weeks. My friends in Silicon Valley, and we had just moved to San Diego. So my friends in Silicon Valley, who, where we had just left, they could have did it in five days. And I was aware of that. 
And it's really hard when you know something's taking you, what is that, 200 days, <laughs> 150 days? It's taking you 150 days, and you know that your colleagues in SF in San Francisco could have done it in five. What do I have to remind myself, though, is that I wasn't going to drop the ball with Alec, our first son. I need to take care of myself. And I'm a new dad. So I don't know what the hell is going on. And I'm still trying to bring in income, right? Because I'm still freelancing. So I was still writing for Playboy and all this. So I'm still freelancing, trying to get this app off the ground and then uh, taking the lead with our son during the day. And so I had to give myself grace. And the best way I found when you got little, little tiny human beings at home, it's actually give yourself time. So if you actually stretch the time, then that comparison game gets a little bit easier. And I gave myself that time and the app got out the door and it did what it was supposed to do. And if I didn't do that app, then there would be no cuddler. Right. If there was no cut, right? If there was no cuddler, then there would be no business coaching, no TED Talks, none of that. Like all that would be gone. I'd be on a different path. I'm sure I'd love the path I would be on, but that was like the seeds of that. And if I allowed myself to get frustrated because I was using somebody else's metrics or the, the metrics of my old life, then I wouldn't have made it. I would get too frustrated. So that's like the number one tip I can give for people who are ambitious like me. You got to stretch the timeline. You have to. I'm even stretching the timeline now, you know, and our kids are like seven and about to turn 10. They're at camp right now, you know, with the summer camp and all that, which is great to have that break. But my wife and I are still on in the morning getting them out the door and then camp isn't necessarily all day. So then I was calculating it and I'm like, I still have like 30 hour work week while the kid, right. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I can just focus, put on, I have a speaker behind me, put on my favorite jazz or hip hop or whatever and zone out and focus on the show, focus on my coach clients. That's it. So I still don't even have the time for a full-time job and they're seven and almost 10. So again, we're kind of in that zone where if we have a young family, we're going to have to stretch a timeline. The second tip I would give, and I talk about this is kind of a theme in my books, is that if you run away to the circus, you're eventually going to have to come back home. And what I mean by that is if you say, I'm just going to focus on my career stuff. Yeah, the kids will be there. They're getting on my last nerve. You and I can both relate to that. Yeah, <laughs> <right>? 100%. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Let's keep it honest now. <laughs> my kids were just getting on my nerves yesterday. Like, so they get on my nerves. They're two boys, so they're fighting over stuff because they're close in age or whatever, whatever the dynamic is. Or they won't sleep at night because they're breastfeeding, whatever the dynamic is. That's going to go away, hopefully for good reasons. And they get older, they mature, they hit puberty, whatever happens. And then you still think that your role is there. I'm just going to put this to the side. And let me focus on this. Let me focus on this new shiny object. And as many parents have said, way wiser than me, the days go by slow, but the years go by fast. So you're going through your grind. Again, we both relate to it. <laughs> you're going through your grind. And it's so easy to get frustrated in that moment. And that's what I'm so thankful for with particularly the journey with Cuddler and the TV and the newspaper features and all that other stuff and the acquisition and all the pomp and circumstance. When we sold the company, then all the spotlight went off, right? Because we sold the company. It's like, we're not founders anymore. Right. And then it was just me and our two-year-old and our kid who was about to come later on the beginning of the following year. We just found out we were pregnant shortly after that. And that was it. That was my entire world. Imagine what would have happened if I did the proverbial running away to the circus and soaked up all that stuff with the ego and, oh, I'm the stuff now. And, oh, yeah, I have the number one app in the world. Oh, I did it again. Oh, I got it twice. We got a quarter million users. We sold the app. And then what's where's my identity? I think there's a parallel here, too, to the other extreme, which my wife and I talk about because we both deal with that. But a lot of people that I coach who have little kids, particularly who are women, deal with this as far as going in the opposite direction where their identity is, I am mom. That's it. And with me taking the lead on a lot of the stay-at-home parenting in the beginning of beginning of that, I could have fell into that where it's like, I'm dad. But they don't need dad like they did 10 years ago. 
you're in a few years ago. Even last year, I can see they're starting to get their distance, which is cool. That's their process. My wife's going through the same thing. It's like, it's like, no, we don't need you quite as much. And so particularly, I found this for women, that can be a dangerous area too, where you're not putting your career on hold and saying, I'll do the book later when they're grown, but they're going to be grown and then you're going to be 20 years down the line. <laughs> like we do the math, like they're in college. It's been 18 years. <laughs> yes. And so I'm trying to help all of us find that balance between the two, not running away to the circus and saying, I'm going to work on my book and forget these kids, <laughs> but then not going in the other camp either where it's like, no, these kids are my life. I will do anything for them and I'm not going to progress at all. And then, you know, 10, 15, 20 years pass and your career is at the same place. And hopefully you still have some type of career. Hopefully you can still resonate with the audiences that you left behind 10, 20 years ago. And I think about how if I waited until our kids were at the point they're at now where they're a lot more independent, that like so quotable, cuddler, all of those things. Try to do that now. There's a pandemic. Like <laughs> there would be a cuddler. Like all that stuff wouldn't exist unless that balance was held. And so that's the biggest recommendation I can give is try to find some type of small way to make progress as far as impacting the people you want to serve, even in the smallest way. A newsletter that comes out once a quarter. Fine. Do that. A YouTube show that you are able to get off the ground and you do an episode once a month and it looks like crap. Again, you can look at my earlier episodes. They look awful, but I have so much pride in them because I started. Exactly. That's it. So good, Damon. I know the audience is just going to be so inspired by this conversation. I know you've got the book coming out October 20th and people are going to want to follow up with you and, and follow your journey, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about your show, about the Bring Your Worth show, and all the things you have coming up? Yeah, thank you for having me, Ashley. So the complete Bring Your Worth collection is available for pre-order. That'll be out October 20th. You get it on uh, Amazon or any of the major bookstores. The Kindle version is pre-ordered, and the paperback pre-order should be up by the time you guys listen to this. You can also get signed copies from me at davenbrown.net, as well as the different merch that I have, such as the Bring Your Worth mug and other things. That's all plays part of passive income. So I'm trying to walk the walk as far as the stuff that I'm talking about as a coach. If you want to coach with me, you can also learn more about that at davenbrown.net. And if you want to watch the Bring Your Worth show, it's at bringyourworth.tv. So finally changed the, the website. So I'm excited about the new URL. Come over and visit me there. You subscribe for free. It's part of the YouTube system at the moment. And I just hit about 300 or so episodes, you know? So if you're new to the show, have fun. <laughs> and it's talking about a lot of stuff that Ashley and I talked about today. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm geeked after this conversation. I'm, the questions that you've asked and the feedback you've given has inspired me too. So thank you, Ashley. Keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate it so much, Damon. Thank you for being on the Talk Freelance to Me show. Absolutely. Thank you, Ashley. And with that, we've come to the end of another episode. Please make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't already done so. And give me a five-star review on Apple. This will help out a lot in getting the word out about this brand new podcast. I invite you to check out the show notes and also grab my free Niches Get Riches freelance writing worksheet to brainstorm the best niches for your writing business. If you're not a writer, you can still use it to get business ideas. And until next time, this is Ashley at Talk Freelance to Me. Don't forget, we all get this one precious life. Don't constrain yourself to a box that you were never meant to fit in. It is your right to profit from your own creative gifts. This podcast was created by Ashley Cisneros Mejia. Our music was composed by Donna Raphael of World Instrumentals. Talk Freelance to Me is a product of Phoenix Creative Studio.